Mr. Patterson, by, uh, by several measures, you are the most successful writer in, in modern history. What was it like? It's frightening. <laughs> what was it like collaborating with the president? It was great. I, you know, um, uh, when I was a kid, uh, I remember Eisenhower came to our little town. We both grew up in small towns. I never forgot that. And so the notion of, of actually spending a year with President Clinton was, was stunning to me. Great opportunity and a great challenge. And, and, and my goal, uh, ho hopefully, was, was to write the best thriller, the best novel about a president ever. And, and with his help, I thought it was th that I could achieve that goal, or we could achieve that goal. To be honest, how helpful was he? And not that. No, he was <laughs> <laughs> no, unbelievably helpful. I think what separates this book from anything I've read and anything most people have read is just the authenticity. Uh, there is a devastating attack against the United States in this, in this, and the president is missing, and it, this is the way it could happen. There's attack against the presidential motorcade. If it happened, this is the way it would happen. There's a traitor in the White House. If it happened, this is the way it would happen. And this is, in addition to writing so much of it, uh, in terms of keeping it authentic, it, it's, it's the president who did that. This was your first foray into the, the world of fiction. What was that, what was that transition like? It was exciting, and I love it because I I'm a big mystery and thriller reader. Have been for almost 40 years, and I read a lot of them every year. And I always wanted to write one. And our mutual friend, lawyer, representative Bob Barnett uh, came to me and said, "You know, I've been trying to get you for years to write one of these. You're not going to do it. Why don't you do one with James Patterson?" And I laughed. I said, "Oh, he'd never fool with me. I'm a neophyte." <laughs> I'll mess up his craft, and so he was willing to do it. And I figured, you know, it would be at a minimum a stunning learning experience, which it was. And I had a good time. But it was real. It's really been a lot of fun for both of us. I think. But we also tried. We agreed on an outline, and sort of like a it really a old-fashioned outline, yeah. skeleton. And then uh, he sent me a list of like twenty questions, literally. And uh, it gave me a feel for what we had to do to put flesh on the bones. And what I wanted to do is to make sure that we were dealing with a real threat, not an imagined one, that something like this could happen, and that we try to achieve what is actually sometimes difficult in the political genre, which is to make something thrilling but possible. And important. I, I, I really think that, especially in the age that we're in right now, that this is as relevant as any book you'll read this year because one of the things we tried to do was, was to let people understand what it's like to be president, how important that job is, how difficult that job is, how dangerous that job is. And, and when we go to elect anybody in the Congress, uh, you know, in the, in the midterms, the, the president, that we understand. And I think people that read this book will get a real memorable portrait of what it's like to see a president under extreme circumstances and understand that job better, a, than, better than they ever have. In a big picture sense, though, the, the book... That is a big picture. Well, it, it, <laughs> but also in a big picture, in the big picture sense, the, the book seems to also uh, be the sort of examination of the legacy of a president. Did writing this, did it, did it force you to examine your own legacy? Not really, not much. For example, in, in the, the impeachment part of the letter, the whole, that all stuff, our president in our book, he freely acknowledges that if he actually had done what they suspect he did, he would be guilty of impeachable offenses that for which he could be convicted and even removed from office. And he freely admits that because of the exceeding partnership, partisanship in Washington, that he didn't tell the Congress enough to know better. In other words, he understands why they're like that. One of the things that the president did, which was interesting in ter just in terms of the, of the partnership, is to keep driving to make these characters more flesh and blood and realistic. Uh, with the president, uh, you know, the president in the book, Duncan, that he's just very realistic. This is a, a human being. This is a, he has flaws. That was important, uh, one of the things that the president pushed. Uh, the, the assassin in the book 
in the first draft, it was kind of like a thriller assassin. You go, ah, okay. But we just kept pushing and pushing and pushing to make this a flesh and blood human being. Yeah, this, this assassin in some ways is the most interesting person in the book because she is the product of the turmoil in the Balkans going back to the 1990s when I served. And the nearest thing was the, the Serbian guy who got the nuclear weapons in the Peacemaker. You remember that in the George Clooney I do. movie? It, it, yeah. There are real people behind a lot of these roles. And we tried to remind people that even the bad guys in this, you will, the, are real people. There's a story. They have a story. They got turned in a certain way. Doesn't justify what they're doing, but it explains it. And it's yeah. important. The chief of staff in the book, who's a woman, very important character. The vice president, another woman, very important character. And we really, and right to the last week, we were working on the president's best friend in the book, Danny Akers, to try to make him more and more real, because he and the president grew up together. The book, also in the book, the president really paints this this bleak picture of the political landscape, and you alluded to it there as well. Uh, he says at one point, quote, our democracy cannot survive its current downward drift into tribalism, extremism, and seething resentment. Today, it's us versus them in America. Politics is, is little more than blood sport. Our willingness to believe the worst about everyone outside of our own bubble is growing. Our ability to solve problems and seize opportunities is, is shrinking. Is, you got to you got to do the audio book because he reads that in the audio book. And it's, that's that's clearly your voice. Is, yeah. is that how you feel about where we are right now? Oh, absolutely. I, I'll give you an example. When I started, look, politics has always been a contact sport. It's a tough business. You don't want to get. It's like if you're a quarterback in pro football, you can't complain when you get sacked, right? I mean, it's a contact sport. You do hope the referees show up wearing black and white stripes instead of the uniform of the other team, which is, you know, your responsibility. But um, it's different now. I mean, one of the reasons that all over the world there's a rise in authoritarianism is that the paralysis of democratic governments fail to produce positive results for ordinary people or a significant block of them. And at the same time, it became possible to obliterate the line between truth and, and fiction. And if people don't know what's true anymore, I'll give you an example. I had an iron rule when I was a young man starting out in politics. I never attacked anybody first. But if they came after me with an attack that had a good answer, I answered. And to take the, metaphor, the football metaphor just a little farther, the NFL has been smart enough now to stop people or try to limit the number yeah. of concussions, to, to limit those ridiculous hits. Yeah, because and we'd like to see that happen in the country what, as well. Yeah, the analog in politics is now hit first, and it doesn't matter if it's a lie or not, just keep telling it. Or what the damage is. Which can be so, and I don't even know if I could win any kind of a race today because of the uh, of that. At really? Least, well, with the old rules, saying because I saw that. I mean, they tell like in the last election, it must have been. I think we counted twenty-five separate stories, blatantly false, just about the work of my foundation in Haiti, just in one place. Just make it up, and if you answer it. If you've got an audience that listens only to you, you just keep saying it. So that's what Duncan's talking about, that we, we could lose the, the democracy we need. The, the Constitution was drawn to force us to work together. But he, and, and that's the key there in terms of du when Duncan makes a speech at the end of the book. But he also says, that's my point of view. I recognize there are other points of view. Let's get together and, and get somewhere by, by, by recognizing that there are two points of view on this thing, or several points of view, actually. And the, the, the whole thing is we, we were supposed to build a stakeholder society, and it's being used to um, the system to drive us apart. 
Yeah. That's interesting. Even the Electoral College, one of the reasons that uh, small rural states got two extra votes was so the big states couldn't run over them. Not so the will of the majority could be thwarted. I mean, we're supposed to be moving toward a more perfect union. If we would keep that in mind and live by it and act by it, the, the, the system would really work very well. A more perfect union. Well, let's talk about North Korea here for, for, for just a moment. As you know, President Trump on Friday announced that the summit in Singapore is, is back on. Um, how do you think that the president has handled the negotiations with the North Koreans so far? And how optimistic should we all be that uh, verifiable denuclearization is going to be the end result? Well, first of all, this is an important issue, and it's important the American people understand what I believe at least the issue really is. If North Korea ever used a nuclear weapon, it would be the end of their country, and the leader of North Korea would be destroyed. So we said, well, why do we have to talk to them then? Because it is becoming an article of faith among dictators around the world that the one way to make sure you can stay in, even if your people hate your guts, is to have a nuclear weapon because if people think you have nothing to lose, then you might use it. But the danger to Americans, the danger to China, the danger to, to Japan, to all the neighbors, is that North Korea can make bombs and missiles and can't bring in a crop. They can't feed themselves. They can't stay warm in the winter. They've got a bankrupt system. So the pressures to sell or even give away for destabilizing purposes, the nuclear material or the technology are pretty high. So we should want this to succeed. Uh, we had eight years when I was president when, because of a deal I made early, that there was no fissile material produced. I had a chance at the end of my presidency, <clears throat> I kind of regret this now, but I would do the same thing again, faced with it, to end their missile program, but I would have had to go to North Korea. So you get rid of the missiles and the nuclear material. But I couldn't do that and finish the Middle East peace. And Arafat begged me not to go and then backed out on his promise to. And you regret that? Well, I regret, I, I made the right decision, that is, if we had peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis, especially back then, it would have been better. But I regret that I didn't end their missile program. Now, maybe once they became part of the axis of evil, it would, you know, it all gone away. But I'm just saying this is important, and we should hope that the president succeeds. And we should wait and see what, how much can be done. The real hero in all this so far is the president of South Korea, President Moon. Look what he did. He got the North Koreans into the Olympics. They did, one, uh, they did a joint team. Uh, he played on the, both the impulses, public impulses of the United States and North Korea. So, and he really wants this. He does not want this headache on his border. So I think there's a chance it will succeed, but it depends upon some measure of trust for them to give up things that they have. That, but I'm just telling you, that most of these, you would never think of North Korea if they didn't cause trouble, would you? That's true. Like, you've got this great program and you ask all these questions. So we need to keep that in mind. This is their trouble causer. It keeps them relevant. It gets them what they need when they need it. So knowing that, though, why would we be optimistic that, that this summit is going to, to lead to them giving up? Because the, the president of South Korea has convinced the president of North Korea that they really do want them to improve their economic fate, and they really don't want to take them over. And pre because the president of North Korea may believe President Trump when he says he doesn't want to replace him, that he thinks he's a strong dictator, and that's a good thing. So we'll just see. But we ought to, all the rest of us ought to be pulling for them to make progress. And we shouldn't be too quick to say it fails if it doesn't cross every T and dot every I. In these deals, you have to make a compromise. And 
So the test every American should have when it's over is, if both sides do what they promise to do, will we be better off? If the other side doesn't, can we get out of this without more harm? If the answer to both those questions is yes, then we should say the summit was a success and worth doing. Switching gears, as, as you know, there is a, a, a reckoning going on in this country surrounding the, uh, the Me Too movement. Uh, a few days ago, in response to, to critics who suggested that you should have resigned in the, in the wake of the Lewinsky scandal, uh, you said that you should not have. If, if you were president now, in 2018, with, with everything that's, that's going on with the Me Too movement, how would you have approached the accusations differently? Or would you have? Well, I don't think it would be an issue because people would be using the facts instead of the imagined facts. In other words, to even make this case, you have to ignore some of the evident facts as some of the older women who've written about this and in a, a amazement saying, can you believe people are saying this guy was defending the Constitution? And of course he shouldn't have resigned. If the facts were the same today, I wouldn't. The... Uh, and I don't want to get into the facts. I'm not going to do anybody's work for them. They can go back and read it. But I also say, where is the media for the last 30 or 40 years? Everybody's known about the casting couch forever. Where, well, but where, this isn't just about the investigation. No, no, this is, you're, you're asking, well, don't we have a right to change the rules? Yes, but you don't have a right to change the facts. So a lot of the facts have been conveniently omitted to make the story work. But I think partly because they're frustrated that they got all these serious allegations against the current occupant of the Oval Office and his voters don't seem to care, so you don't ever talk about that. There's been, I've, and it, I think that the answer is no, I think I did the right thing. I defended the Constitution. Unlike our president, the grounds, even if true, were insufficient grounds, as Newt Gingrich admitted to me. It was a political struggle, as it always is, and they wanted to abolish a fundamental principle of democracy, which is that we should all live under the same set of rules. You think this president's been given a pass with regards to the, the, the women who have come forward and accused him of sexual misconduct? Oh, well, I think that, that, no. But it hadn't gotten anything like the coverage that you would expect with 19 people. Those poor 19 women have been lost because I think that they got, you have other things to cover. And I think people think that his constituents don't care. and. So you just keep going. It's what I let me just let, gotta say it in another word. I loved what Starbucks did last week um, over civil rights. You know, closing down the times. I, I like the Me Too movement. It's way overdue. I think that it doesn't mean I agree with everything. I still have some uh, questions about some of the decisions which have been made. But time's up. Yeah. is important, too, because they talk about how creating a culture in which there are no more victims. And so I was thinking, I wonder whether Starbucks is a good model for companies to deal with uh, trying to root out harassment, discrimination, unwanted approaches. Last question here, I, because one of the things that this, this Me Too era has done, it's forced a, a lot of women uh, to speak out, women who feel emboldened now. One of those women, Monica Lewinsky, she wrote in an op-ed um, that the Me Too movement changed her view of sexual harassment. Quote, he was my boss, he was the most powerful man on the planet, he was 27 years my senior, with enough life experience to know better. He was at the time, at the pinnacle of his career, while I was in my first job uh, out of college. Looking back on what happened then, through the lens of Me Too now, um, do, you, do you think differently or feel more responsibility? Um, no, for... I felt terrible then. And I came to grips with it. Did you ever apologize no, and to her? No, yes, and nobody believes that I got out of that for free. I left the White House $16 million in debt. But you typically have ignored gaping facts in describing this, and I bet you don't even know them. because So I am not going there. This was litigated 20 years ago. Two-thirds of the American people sided with me. They were not insensitive to that. I had a sexual harassment policy when I was governor in the 80s. I had two women chiefs of staff when I was governor. 
women were overrepresented in the attorney general's office in the 70s for their percentage in the bar. I've had nothing but women leaders in my office since I left. You are giving one side and omitting facts. Mr. President, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to present a side. I'm no, not, no, I'm, you asked me if I agreed. The answer is no, I don't. And I, well, I asked if you'd ever apologized, and you said you had. I have. You've apologized to her. I apologize to everybody in the world I'm wrong. But you didn't apologize to her, at least according to, to folks that we've talked to. There was never a, an apology. Made. I have not talked to her. Do you I, feel I like you owe it, her an apology? No, I do. I, I, I do not. I have never talked to her. But I did say publicly on more than one occasion that I was sorry. Okay. That's very different. The apology was public. And you don't think a private apology is owed? I think this thing has been, it's 20 years ago. Come on, let's talk about JFK. Let's talk about, you know, LBJ. Stop already. Okay. Yeah, that's also interesting. What? What part? Just this, what he just said. I don't think President, you think President Kennedy should have resigned? Do you believe President Johnson should have resigned? Uh, Someone President, should ask you these questions because of the way you formulate the questions. Mr. President, I was, again, Senator Gillibrand, she raised the issue. Others have raised the issue in this, in, during the Me Too movement. I was just. So you're, you're, you're here asking it now. Yeah, that's what. <clears throat> but when you filtered the question back to me, there was a, gr a stunning article by a conservative woman who didn't even like me in the uh, New York Daily News, which had more facts about what happened 20 years ago than anyone out there. And she said, you know, we should not cheapen victimhood. And so you just draw your own conclusions. I dealt with it 20 years ago plus, and the American people, two thirds of them stayed with me. And I've tried to do a good job since then with my life and with my work. That's all I have yeah. to say to you. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patterson. Okay. Mr. President. Hello, Today fans. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking that button down there and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives.